The story begins with someone mentally saying that she may have desired him, but she didn't love him. The clatter of a cane on the floor. A man with that very cane was heading in a poorly lit room towards a girl with blonde hair. When half of his face, the lower part with the scar, was illuminated, he asked her what was wrong. Did he seem more horrible up close? The next moment, he abruptly and painfully grabs his interlocutor, a fragile girl by the wrist. The girl gasps in surprise, and her face expresses that she is in pain. So holding the girl's hand, he asked her with a menacing, terrifying face if that was why she had cheated on him, if it was because the Baron was so good-looking. Then he also asked if this serpent had promised the girl eternal love. The girl began to make attempts to free herself by pulling out her arm and telling him to think whatever he wanted. After her words, the man gritted his teeth. The next moment he answered the girl menacingly, addressing her by the name of Madeline, that whatever she did to change that, for she was still his wife, and he her husband. The girl was mortified at his words, looking at him with wide open eyes. Tears welled up in her eyes. She grinned and said that he was her husband, and that he really thought he had the right to call himself that, since he had never addressed her as his wife. At the end she said loudly and seriously, that the marriage was over. Her words stunned her husband very much. He squeezed her hand tighter and asked her if she really loved him. The girl was in pain, and making an agonizing sound, she told him to let her go. Her husband replied menacingly that she could not get away from him. His look was wearying. He continued that she would not leave him even if she died, and even if the damned estate collapsed. The girl hysterically asked him why he was doing this to her. Screaming and asking him what she had done to him, the girl finally pulled her hand out. Turning around, she pointed away from her husband. As she did so, she glared at him, and walking forward shouted that she refused to stay here and she could not spend the rest of her life here, imprisoned like a ghost. Her husband has no right to keep her at all. After these words, the girl's supporting foot slipped on the rungs of the stairs, which she began to descend. It was as if time had stopped and the girl, reaching forward, began to fall forward, straight down the stairs. At that moment, she remembered her husband's question about whether she had loved another. In response, she thought that if she could afford such a luxury, it would be revenge, not love. The moment she started to fall, her husband reached out to grab her and keep her from falling. It was revenge, not love. Revenge on this man, her husband, who had kept the girl locked up until the girl had withered away. Revenge on Ian Nottingham. The girl at that moment was falling down the stairs with horrifying sounds. Her body, with its head pierced, fell to the floor just outside the staircase. Blood oozed from her head. From her fall, the blood even got on the trophy of the lion's head. Because of the bleeding, the girl's eyes were blurry, and it seemed to her that the lion's face had become gloating. At that moment, she assumed that her death would probably be the end of it all. Tears streamed down her tired eyes. She thought wretchedly that she had endured it for six years, but in the end she had become nothing but a disgraced, unfaithful wife. The last thing she saw before she closed her eyes forever was her husband sobbing desperately. She figured that was fine with her too. If it made him feel despair for a second, that was enough for her. The girl thought that if hell awaited her after death, dead or alive, she was ready to come to Hades, for at least in his domain, she would be free from her husband. But when she opened her eyes, it was neither hell nor heaven, but Rowanfield Manor, when she was 17 years old. The girl was sitting in front of the mirror reading a newspaper, and at that moment the maid was combing her perfect golden hair. The maid asked the girl, addressing her as Miss, if she was feeling better. Outside the window the birds were chirping, the girl mooed in response as if she didn't know what the maid was talking about. The maid asked Miss not to pretend, for she had not been feeling well lately, and they were all worried that it might be some serious illness. The girl at this point mentally shared that she could assume that she had been acting crazy for the past three days. Crying, laughing, and then crying again. The girl answered aloud that she was fine, and thanked the maid. The maid also asked the girl if she was worried about something, because the girl had never read newspapers like this before. But the girl confidently said that she was really fine. 
We are further told that the girl has returned to the year 1914, the year when her failures began. When her mother died, she and her father had lived a relatively happy life. Her father was obsessed with the luxurious aristocratic life and she had no interest in anything except for pretty dresses. She didn't care at all about what was going on in the world. Naturally, they could not keep up with the times. The girl remembered a terrible event in her life. The night they lost their entire fortune because of a failed business venture, her father hanged himself in his study. The will he left at that time did not mention his own daughter. What was a young girl without a dowry to do? So she married the Earl of Nottingham, a man she had never even met. But even such an opportunity was wonderful for a girl in her position. The war had badly traumatized the Earl of Nottingham. Alone in the future, they dragged each other into an abyss of despair, and their marriage ended in tragedy. The next moment we see a girl walking through the woods. In her hands was a pink umbrella that hid her from the sun. As she walked through the woods, she pondered if she was 17 again. Soon they would lose their fortune and if she could talk her father out of investing in this venture and maybe their future would change. However, her foolish father is on a grand tour when they need to watch their spending. The man visited Rome and admired the art of the Renaissance. Between the 10th and early 19th centuries, it had been a popular trip to Europe among English nobility. The girl remarked that the fact that he hadn't even mentioned her in his will was certainly surprising. Suddenly thought a rather strong wind. The girl held up her hair flying to the sides from the wind. Suddenly someone addressed the girl, calling her Madeline. The girl looked up in amazement at the person speaking. Madeline saw her father, who inquired of the girl whether she had come out to meet him. He then remarked that it was very nice of his daughter, and he verbally encouraged her to get into the carriage on which he was returning home. Still standing quietly under the umbrella and looking at her father, Madeline thought about how she would be lying if she said she never resented her father for leaving her like that. But either way, a part of her still missed him. The girl reached out and put her hand into her father's hand. She remarked that she finally grew up without needing anything and it was all thanks to her father. She confidently stated that she had been given a second chance and she couldn't miss it. Madeline walked up the steps and into the carriage, still holding her father's hand. The girl realized that she needed to find a way to survive in these troubled times. But first of all, she must avoid meeting Ian Nottingham. However, in the carriage in which the girl's father was traveling and which she had just climbed into, there was a man sitting on the other side by the window. The father told his daughter that he had invited a special guest. After a moment, he asked the guest for permission to introduce his daughter. Madeline was shocked to realize what kind of man this was. Her eyes widened and she stared at him in horror. The father turned to the man, Mr. Nottingham. This was Madeline's future husband, a scarless and pleasant enough man. The carriage continued on its way to Madeline and her father's estate. Her father inquired of their special guest if he had completed all the business that had caused him to travel to town. Smiling brightly, Madeline's father added that he hoped he had not pulled Mr. Nottingham out of his busy schedule with his invitation. The gentleman replied that, not at all. Madeline's father remarked happily that he was pleased to hear that. The girl, however, was very uncomfortable. She looked at Mr. Nottingham and thought that in her past life he had been in London at this time. That was why she had never seen him. Ian looked perfect, straight back, perfect suit, good hair. The girl's father remarks that he has heard that another of his investments has been incredibly successful and adds that Mr. Nottingham's business acumen is incredible. The girl at this point is very puzzled. Is this man really Ian Nottingham? But it can't be, because in his previous life he was completely different. The girl remembered how her husband Ian had broken the water glass then, horrifyingly shouting that he had told her not to dare touch it. At that moment, the girl was terribly frightened. She was very embarrassed and stammering she wanted to reply that she hadn't meant to at all. But the next moment Ian fell to his knees. Servants immediately flew over to him, addressing the Lord and shouting for someone to call a doctor. This was what her husband had been like in her previous life. The girl did not take her eyes off the man at that moment. The man noticed it, surprised, 
and after a second he changed his face to a calm one with a slight smile. The girl looked surprised, and the next moment she looked away dejectedly. She took a moment to notice that she was sitting across from Ian Nottingham, but this was clearly not the man she knew. Unexpectedly, Madeline's father shared that he had heard that Mr. Nottinger loved high riding. The guest replied that yes, he does. Madeline's father glowered, noting how refined it was. The girl was still mortified and mentally repeated the horse racing information once more. The man before her, neither suffering from a limp nor raising his voice at her, could not be the same man from her past life. In the next instant, we are back in Madeline's past life, 22 years ago. It was slowly getting darker outside, and the sun was slowly disappearing over the horizon, leaving a bright orange imprint on the ground. Madeline sat in her wedding dress on a small couch holding a wedding bouquet of roses. Suddenly the butler approached her, noticing the girl's excitement. He asked her if he was worried. Madeline replied that she was a little. The butler said that his lordship was a good man, so she should not be afraid. The girl stated confidently that she wasn't afraid. All she was worried about was whether she could be a good spouse. Not that she harbored any hatred for Ian. Even though they didn't love each other, she wanted them to have a good marriage. She had made a vow to be a beacon for such a wounded man, to be faithful to him, to help him recover, and to be a wise and worthy wife. It was already dark outside, and Madeline sat on the couch with the bouquet in her hands. On their first wedding night, however, her modest dreams came to a crashing halt. Ian never opened the door to their bedroom, not the next day, not even a day later. Late one night, walking down the corridor, the girl met him and wanted to say something, but he just walked past her without saying anything. The girl was dumbfounded by his action. The next moment we see the girl eating a meal. She ate in proud solitude. Her husband, Ian, did not want to spend a single minute of his life with her. The next moment we see Madeline coming into Ian's office. The girl has taken stock of the fact that her husband seems to have forgotten her existence. However, she received an answer from him that he hadn't at all. The girl frowned at her husband, who was clearly more engrossed in the papers than his wife. The girl declared then confidently that she was bored. This caught Mr. Nottergham's attention. The next moment, we see a small, just a tiny puppy. The girl was told that it was a gift from his lordship. Madeline, who was reading a book at the moment, slammed it shut and walked over to the dog, thinking about the fact that her husband had given her a puppy so she wouldn't get bored. The girl reached out her hand to the trembling little lump. The dog began to sniff and suddenly began to lick the girl's outstretched finger. Medlin was amazed and suddenly tears came to her eyes. She took the puppy in her arms and hugged him, mentally noting that he was just as scared as she was. Madeline was brought back from her memories to her new life. Her father announced sharply and cheerfully they had arrived. This made the girl wince. Madeline's father sparklingly shared with Mr. Nottingham that this was their home, Rowanfield Manor. It was built in a revival style, and few people in their part of the country build like this. Madeline's father was greeted by the butler, telling him welcome back and wondering if the trip had gone well. Smiling, Father Madeline replied that yes, yes, they had a special guest, so they should better prepare tea and cookies. The father turned cheerfully to his daughter walking awkwardly behind, and inquired of Madeline if she would like to show their estate to Mr. Nottingham while tea was being prepared for them. The girl awkwardly replied that she was not feeling well. The father awkwardly asked his daughter if she could then play the piano while they drank tea. Madeline at this moment cast an awkward glance at Mr. Nottingham, and this glance was not unnoticed by the guest himself. The girl apologized, saying that she would like to lie down. Madeline's father began to be slightly indignant and nervously replied to the girl that he was their dear guest. Mr. Nottingham, however, put out his hand, saying that he had no objection at all. The next moment, Mr. Nottingham bowed to the girl, saying that he was pleased to make their acquaintance. Madeline once again apologized to Mr. Nottingham. She still couldn't believe that Ian Nottingham was here, right in front of her. But right now, he was not yet shattered by the misfortune. As these thoughts flashed through her mind, the girl really wondered if she should interfere in his life and make sure nothing happened. The girl sadly mentally asked herself, hadn't she put up with enough? 
Their path together has no future, so they'd better never get close again. It would be better for both of them if this brief encounter was their last. After mentally saying these words, the girl turned around and walked away from the company of her father and Mr. Nottingham. Madeline thought she would escape her past life, and then she wouldn't have to cross paths with him. The next moment we see Madeline studying some papers. She was muttering to herself that she needed to sell the estate and the land before the war started. She was sure that if they kept an eye on expenses and moved to the countryside, they would get by. She put the papers on the table, realizing that if she didn't get her father to stop gambling and throwing money around, then the they would definitely end up on the street. The girl wondered what to do. Suddenly, someone knocked at her door. It was her father. Turning to the girl and looking out from behind, he asked if he could come in. The girl was glad to see her father. She answered him that of course he could come in. She was just about to pay him a visit herself. The father slid the invitation across the table and held it out to his daughter, saying it was for her from London. The father happily replied that it was a good time to make her debut in high society. The girl looked at this invitation and mentally replied to her father that this was not the time for balls and socializing. The girl herself exhaled, asking her father if she was obligated to make her debut. The father froze at the girl's question, not understanding why she was asking that. Suddenly, he turned to his daughter Madeline, asking her worriedly if the girl was unhappy. His daughter clearly hadn't expected such a question either, and apologized questioningly in response. He was just puzzled that his daughter had been lecturing him all day about spending less money, after which he inquired that after that she really didn't want to get married. Madeline at this point sipped tea from her cup, telling her father that she had said no such thing. Her father, however, indignantly and worriedly added that refusing to make her debut into high society was like refusing to marry. He shared that he'd even bought them a tan house in London so they could stay there. The girl put the cup and saucer back on the table with a clink and remembered something. After which, she confidently declared that this house they must sell. Madeline's father was already extremely indignant, asking the girl not to talk nonsense. But Madeline went on, adding to make her father forget about the wine investments. The father was puzzled as to how the daughter knew about them. Then something occurred to the father, and he jumped up and asked his daughter if she had read his letters. He then indignantly added that it was very mean and low on his daughter's part. He declared that his daughter should stay away from his business, for such things were not in the mind of a young lady. Madeline was cold at his words. She sat silent, with a calm face. The girl turned to her father, following his words and taking in her hand an envelope with an invitation to high society. She also declared that if he invested even a penny in the wine business, she would not even look in the direction of high society and certainly would not marry. Picking up the letter, the girl threw it with her hand on the table. The father said his daughter's name indignantly and angrily. Madeline smiled sweetly, saying that she was just taking note and that if her father persisted, she would be a nun without remorse. Her father was shaken with anger and indignation at the words from his daughter's lips. He declared that enough was enough, and addressing his daughter as Madeline Rowanfield, declared that she was forbidden to leave the room until she apologized. The next moment, we find ourselves in London, in high society. Madeline inquires of her father if he is certain that he has given the contracts to the fire. He replies that of course he did. The girl had even been standing over his head the whole time. She also asked her father that she hoped he didn't have the copies. The father anxiously replied to his daughter that of course he didn't, and why would he lie? He asked his daughter to let someone invite her to the tens. The picture of a man asking a lady in a pink delicate dress to dance was just before them. Madeline's father was clearly discouraged because the girl had already refused six invitations, and he asked his daughter what had gotten into her. She had already scared all the young men away from her. The girl was discouraged and replied that she was just not sure yet. The father was puzzled and exhaled and said that Madeline was like a daughter of the Rowanfield family. There is a duty to marry well and support their family. The father turned around and replied in a terribly depressed manner that he honestly did not understand her. 
his daughter. The girl mentally turned to her father, and she realized that this season of socializing would be interrupted by the war. The girl herself exhaled heavily. She simply does not want to play the role of a beautiful doll anymore. This time, she wants to choose her own destiny. She realized that if she could keep them from collapsing, she would also find the right path. Lowering her arms, she wondered if she should continue to learn the piano. She had heard that after the war, women could work too. Maybe one day she would get a job too. This encouraged the girl and she blushed a little at such wonderful thoughts. Suddenly she was accosted by a man and went straight to the girl. It was Ian Nottingham who remarked that Miss Roanfield did not seem at all interested in holidays. The girl was very puzzled by her appearance and mentally said his full name, Ian Nottingham. The girl turned away awkwardly, replying that not at all, she was just... The girl asked Mr. Nottingham if he thought the whole thing strange. Nottingham clarified why it should be weird, as he only sees people having fun wholeheartedly. Madeline said that it pissed her off to see people having fun with no idea what the future held for them. A servant passed by with a tray of wine glasses. One of them was just in the hands of Mr. Nottingham, who laughed at the girl's answer and added that there was some truth in her words. He added that they did not know what the future had in store for them, and they dared not even guess. He took one glass from the tray. After that, he asked the girl, the, why shouldn't they enjoy the present while they had the opportunity, and told the girl that she relaxed a little, and she... She listened attentively, and Ian continued that giving up the joy of the present would not turn tomorrow away from coming. The girl was even more dejected. She turned away from the man, saying she was already relaxed. She was clearly uncomfortable. Mr. Nottingham clearly did not expect this action of the girl and looked at her questioningly. Madeline added that she just thought that such a pointless celebration was just a waste of time. The man hesitated at her answer. Madeline went on to say that what she means is that there is no value in all of this and she is not burning to make people stop dancing. The girl added that she just doesn't want to do it herself. Mr. Nottingham's face lit up with a smile and he suddenly asked the girl what about dancing with him. Madeline was visibly taken aback at his suggestion and apologized questioningly. The next instant, Mr. Nottingham addressed the girl formally, calling her Dear Miss Madeline Rowanfield and asked her if she would give him this dance. The girl was shocked, and at that moment thoughts arose in her mind that she was not obliged to save from anyone and was not obliged to save Ian. She had always been adamant that she should use her second chance at life to get as far away from Ian Nottingham as possible. The girl recalled a moment from her past life as she ran down the stairs from her husband. Probably coming back to reality, she had a glimpse that, however, if nothing changes and Ian goes to war and their terrible things will happen to him, war would cripple not only his body, but his soul as well. So she realized that a little nudge in the right direction couldn't hurt. And if that very nudge would make even a small difference in his life, maybe she could afford to give him a little advice. In the next moment, we see a group of three men sitting on couches at a social gathering. One of them holds up a cigar and asks to look at the girl. One of his interlocutors replies that there are too many women here for him to know which one he is talking about. That cigar guy replies that he was counting how many men this lady has already blown away. With his hand, he was pointing in Madeline's direction. She's turned down six men while they've been sitting here, and she's refused to dance with six men. His interlocutor remarked that she had just made her debut, so apparently she was not too desperate yet, though she did not look of marriageable age. In this company sat Mr. Ian Nottingham, who, on seeing the girl, recognized her at once. He remembered the moment when she had said that she did not feel well. He wondered mentally if this was the Baron's daughter. Madeline stood thoughtfully, fanning her chin. He mused mentally that it was amusing. The guy who had been counting the number of men the girl had turned down asked his friends if he should approach her. Another guy told him that he didn't even know her and it wasn't polite. The other guy in turn remarked that they were not of the Victorian era, and it was improper to make conversation with a lady in their day. Ian, meanwhile, put the cup on the table, then stood up and patted the shoulder of his companion, who intended to approach Madeline. Mr. Nottingham himself made his way towards the girl. One of the lads was indignant, and the other, from pleasant surprise, 
added that he did not think he would live to see the day when Ian Nottingham himself would approach some lady. Madeline agreed to dance after all. As they danced, all eyes were on them. People were telling each other to watch and whispering that this was the fourth dance these two were dancing. One girl asked another who was the lady who was dancing Mr. Nottingham himself. The other replied that as far as she knew it was some noble woman from the provinces. Ian and Madeline were circling the room. Mr. Nottingham turned to Miss Rowanfield, asking the girl if she was all right. The girl was obviously surprised by the question and apologized questioningly. Ian noticed that her hands were trembling rather violently. The girl was insanely discouraged. Ian added that the girl yes and was looking at him as if she was sorry. They stopped dancing. Ian squeezed her hand tighter. Suddenly, another couple accidentally pushed the girl and she flew right into Ian's arms, who spoke loudly to Miss Roanfield, telling her to be careful. A red-pink flower began to fall from the head of the girl who had accidentally pushed Madeline. Ian, at that moment, held the girl by the waist closer to him, and Madeline thought that if somehow their destinies intertwined again, she might go through a year of loneliness and live an unhappy life again. The girl did not realize what would happen then. We go back to her past life when she was already 26 years old. The girl was sitting in her hat and apron in front of a bush of red and pink flowers. She noticed one flower missing and wondered who had done it, for every person on the estate knows how much the girl winds up about this garden. Behind her ran a now-grown dog. Medaly called her dog, Cory, and asked if it was his paws. The girl snorted and a slight smile appeared on her face. She suggested aloud that perhaps not, for her dog might have eaten the rose, but it was unlikely that he would have been able to bite it off so evenly. Cory only barked happily. The girl stared at the rose, but smiled and remarked that, whoever it was, she hoped that the rose had brought him some joy. Then the girl asked Cory, didn't she? Cory barked an exclamation. The next moment, it was already raining heavily outside. Madeline called out to Cory and asked where he was. The maid and butler ran after her. The maid told mistress that the pressure was too strong and she might catch cold. But Madeline did not listen to her and kept calling for Cory. The butler, who had reached them, said that he would look for him himself as soon as the rain cleared, and then asked the girl to go back into the house. But Madeline aggressively told the butler named Sebastian to get back in the house. She confidently stated that she would find Cory on her own. She was asked how they could leave their mistress. The girl continued to answer aggressively, saying that they should not pretend to care for her, because they were just afraid that the Count would get angry. But they replied that, no, that's not the case. Suddenly, her husband appeared in the rain and called his wife by name. Ian told his wife to go back to the manor. The girl, with tears in her eyes, said about her dog. Ian, however, said that she had just forgotten about him. After all, it was just an animal, and he couldn't let a man go down with an illness and for some dog. Madeline was shocked by his words. Her eyes widened as much as possible and tears froze in her eyes. The girl bit her lip, asking him how. How could he do that? because he had given it to her, and he was the only one on the estate who cared about her. After the girl's speech, her husband Ian came up to her and put his hand on her shoulder, squeezing it lightly. He addressed the girl by name, menacingly telling her to go inside. Tears could not stop flowing from the girl's eyes. She was out of genuine disappointment. Suddenly, she was brought back from her memories to her reality. When she was addressed as Miss Rowanfield, and asked if she was all right. It was Mr. Nottingham who asked. The girl waved his hand away, saying that yes, she was all right. In the next instant, the girl sat down as befitted a lady and remarked that she had enjoyed her time with Mr. Nottingham very much, after which she bade him good night and departed. But as she was leaving, Mr. Nottingham turned to her and a little more quietly remarked that the girl had not warmed up even after four dances, and added that he was somewhat disappointed. A lot of delicious food began to be brought into the hall. The whole table would be laden with all sorts of viands. The girl thought about how fair it was, not that she'd expected to avoid Ian Nottingham in such a tight aristocratic circle for the rest of her life, but that didn't mean she expected to sit directly across from him. She also mentally noted that her ears were particularly not eager to be part of a conversation in raised tones. 
The girl sipped something from her glass, however, as if it were not. At that moment at the table, a woman sitting next to Mr. Nottingham slammed her hands on the table and asked him, how dare he speak like that? Ian responded by telling her to give in to her emotions and turned to the girl named Isabel, then added to lower her voice, because that was why she was being manipulated by that lowlife. Isabel was outraged, and she queried about not indulging in emotion, and what had he just called him, a lowlife? Madeline remarked that this was what she was like, Isabel Nottingham. When she'd married Ianam in a previous life, he'd had no living relatives. His younger brother Erie had volunteered on the front lines and died in battle, and his sister Isabel had died in an accident before the fighting even started. Rumor had it that the accident was no accident. Apparently, she had been with a man and a much less noble family, and having managed to overcome the prejudices of society, the two of them had decided to settle the score and life together. Madeline continued to drink quietly from her glass and thought about the fact that there were times that Ian would not have been so broken if he had relatives alive. The man sitting next to her was saying something. Madeline went on to say that after Isabel's death, Ian never touched her things and always kept them in their place. He did it as if he wanted to have an eternal reminder of the bitter regret and the plaque. Madeline remembered her past life again, 22 years ago. She was playing the piano, just pressing the keys on it, and noticed that it was the same piano Lady Isabel had played. Looking around the room, she noticed not a speck of dust in this room, not very well cared for, and the piano in the whole room was clean to a high shine. Madeline assumed that Ian loved his sister Isabel very much. Suddenly, something fell to the floor. It was a photograph which the girl took in her hand. It showed Lady Isabel and someone else whom she did not recognize. But the picture said it was for her lover, Zachary Miloff. The girl saw the sheet music on the piano and other pictures between those minutes, so she assumed that the picture had fallen out of there. She put it back and noticed the other pictures. Madeline also noticed that the sheet music was handwritten and wondered if Isabel had composed it herself. She realized that Lady Isabel had written this song for her lover. She thought mentally that she had heard that he was a socialist, though Madeline herself did not know much about politics. The girl began to run her fingers over the keys, and she mentally wondered that she wondered what Isabel Nottingham was like. Perhaps she was a refined lady who loved to play the piano, or a woman in whom life and passion were so vibrant that she was willing to die for love. Madeline sat down at the piano, whatever it was, and suddenly she came to the thought that whatever kind of person Isabel was, the sound of her piano as she walked the earth must have enveloped even this gloomy estate in a sunny and pleasant embrace. Madeline began to play Isabel's piano. Playing, the girl thought that if Lady Isabel were alive, maybe her husband Ian but before she could finish her thought, the door to the room opened loudly and with horror. The girl stopped playing. She addressed her husband by name, but he told her to get out. Mr. Nottingham trembled with anger. The girl curled her lip at his words, and addressing her husband by name again said that she was his wife, and if he had any respect for her, he would let her explain why. Ian answered her fearfully, never to dare enter that room again. The girl came back to the present. She was still holding the glass to her lips, and in remembering that moment, she'd assumed then, and based on his reaction, that Ian had a strong attachment to his family. But looking at them now, she realized they were literally ready to claw at each other's throats. Something tinkled. Isabel rose from the table and aggressively told her brother that he was the lowlife. Grabbing her hat and putting it on her head, the girl began to remove herself, saying that she was content and her brother's society was depriving her of air. She also declared that she no longer wished to live in such a place. Madeline's heart raced. The hat Isabel was wearing made the girl realize that today was the day of Isabel's death. George sat next to the girl, noting that brother and sister often quarreled. Madeline stood up abruptly from the table, apologizing. She headed away, saying she would be back soon. George called out to her, but the girl was rapidly leaving. Mr. Nottingham stared after her. Madeline ran up the stairs after Lady Isabel, calling her name. When she caught up with her, she grabbed Lady Isabel's hand and turned her attention to her. Isabel's eyes were filled with tears. Turning to Madeline, she turned away abruptly, 
apologizing and adding that she had to go. Madeline begged her to stay, and then suddenly asked if Isabel was going to her lover. Isabel shuddered at her words, and turning round, apologized questioningly and indignantly inquired if the girl had been eavesdropping on their conversation all this time. Madeline, however, answered confidently that she was not eavesdropping. Isabel wrenched her hand from her grasp and said that of course she had been eavesdropping, for they say that her brother, Mr. Nottingham, has all sorts of impudent women around him. Isabel wondered if the girl thought she would thus attract her brother's attention. Madeline shouted and asked Isabel if she was going to see Mr. Miloff. Isabel, who was heading for the exit, flinched and turned to Madeline and asked how the girl knew about him. Madeline replied that Isabel need not worry, for she would not tell anyone. The girl added that she did not know anything about socialism or whatever it was called. Isabel asked if the girl had informed Isabel's brother, Mr. Nottingham. Madeline replied that of course not. Madeline exhaled, saying that Mr. Nottingham was a well-bred gentleman, but not without a flaw in his stubbornness. Isabel replied to Madeline's remark that she would not call him a gentleman at all. Then Madeline also remarked that Mr. Nottingham was also a master at making people fit in. Isabel remarked that the girl seemed to know him very well. Madeline took Isabel's hand in hers and added that she'd learned from experience and confidently stated that Isabel didn't need to give in to her brother Ian's stubbornness and desire for control. The girl sadly shared that she had once broken her pride for men and had ruined her life with it. Madeline covered her eyes at the memory of her past life, continuing that she had even taken the road of no return just to vent her anger. The girl mentally noted that when she squeezed Isabel's hand, she wasn't worried about tangling with Ian again. She just wanted to save the woman in front of her. Madeline saw that a woman who was blinded by rage would suffer a sad fate. A woman who looked so much like Madeline. She said aloud that it might seem like there was no other way out, but that wasn't true. Because there were so many ways in the world they hadn't tried. Isabel was awkward at first and remained silent. However, after a moment she replied that, okay, and now asked Madeline to please let go of her hand. At that moment, someone was coming down the stairs. That person turned out to be Mr. Nottingham. The girls were slightly taken aback to see him. He noticed Miss Roanfield holding his sister Isabel's hand in his, and his gaze became questioning. Descending ever closer to the ladies, Mr. Nottingham said that this was a matter between him and his sister, after which he asked Madeline to leave them, please. Isabel, however, put her arm around Madeline's arm, shouting that she did not, and asking the girl what she said her name was. The girl replied that her name was Madeline Roanfield, whereupon Isabel immediately shouted to her brother that she would stay with Miss Roanfield. Mr. Nottingham looked at his sister puzzledly. He had picked up on his sister Isabel, hitting on a lady she had just met. Madeline was mortified and genuinely didn't understand why. Isabel, on the other hand, said that they were socializing, and her brother had no business prying into their conversations. Mr. Nottingham continued to watch, observing the girls. Madeline asked if Isabel could please let go of her hand, and Isabel in turn wondered who had grabbed her hand first. Mr. Nottingham sighed and turned around, and asked his sister to please remember that every action has consequences. Whereupon Mr. Nottingham immediately turned to Miss Roanfield, telling her that he did not know where the girl was from with his sister's acquaintance. But to meddle with other people's families was not the most sensible behavior. The girls were puzzled at his words. After this, Mr. Nottingham departed. Isabel did not understand who her brother thought he was, if he was her father. Madeline, meanwhile, was angry, for she knew that Mr. Nottingham had not even bothered to thank her for calming his sister. The next moment we see Madeline sitting in a chair reading a newspaper. She remembered that in the past the newspapers had been buzzing about Isabel, but today they were reporting on something else, so she was obviously safe and well. That certainly pleased Madeline, and she was relieved. Stopping reading the paper, the girl covered her eyes, thinking about how there was probably no one in her past life to stop Isabel if this fight was their last interaction with Ian. She remembered how, in her past life, Isabel was playing the piano, and an angry Ian burst into the room, tears in his eyes at that moment. Madeline noted that she now realized that he had given her a piano of her own, 
shortly after that incident. She suggested that maybe he was apologizing, but that was alas not so important now. The girl's gaze was fixed on several invitations. More importantly, she noted that the next social evening would be at the Kolhat country estate. The next moment, we find ourselves at the country estate of the Kolhat family. Another social gathering? Madeline hesitated to go inside and looked around, noticing that Ian hadn't come today, which meant she could make new acquaintances. Suddenly, she was held out her hand and addressed by her full name, like Miss Madeline Rowanfield. It was one of Ian's friends, the guy who'd counted how many guys she'd blown off the first night. He was smiling and the girl was clearly taken aback by his appearance, but she put her hand in his and thanked him. As they headed for the dance, the man added that it had been worthwhile to arrange this evening, if only for the chance to accompany her, Miss Roanfield. The girl mentally thought about the fact that even in her past, the man had left many a girl in tears with such compliments. The man noticed that they were just drinking tea overloaded and asked the girl if she was hungry. The girl said no. After that, they sat down on the neighboring chairs, the man asked Miss Roanfield if she had been to Vienna. Because it was an incredibly modern and developed city, it is not even possible to describe in words how picturesque it is, and he was sure that the girl liked it very much. The man took the champagne from the tray and shared that one veen, but to him the thought that mankind was in for a snowless progress. Madeline awkwardly replied that she understood, and mentally added that unfortunately war would raise this city to the ground addressing the man as George. George started to hold out one of Madeline's glasses, but suddenly someone else grabbed the glass, telling George that he didn't know if the man really meant it. It was Ian Nottingham, who appeared in the girl's Sasdi, and he appeared in the company of his brother and sister. Someone remarked that they were late. Standing in the distance, people started whispering, saying, God, are the Nottinghams there? One guy said that apparently George was in the same class as Mr. Nottingham, People kept whispering that they were so elegant and it was good that they had come today. Madeline was embarrassed to see Ian and look at his company. She realized that the guy was Eric, who at that moment was crouched next to George, saying how many years, how many winters. She sat down against the girl Isabel, who began to look warily at Madeline. George inquired of Eric if the latter disagreed with his theory. Their conversation immediately caught Madeline's attention. Eric replied enthusiastically, that he wasn't sure that humanity would continue to make peaceful progress. His older brother, Ian, added that humans are selfish creatures, and it is in their nature to compete with each other and destroy everything in their path. So ironically, it is because of this that they have been able to make progress. Ian was asked if he meant that development depended on military power. Madeline continued to listen to them attentively, and Isabel got up from her chair and went somewhere. The men continued to talk about how reform always goes hand in hand with demolition. George asked, puzzled, if he thought warfare was possible in their age, for the world had never been as economically cohesive as it was now. Ian hesitated and asked permission to disagree. He pointed out that if the need arose, a new armed conflict was sure to happen. Madeline looked at Mr. Nottingham attentively and dejectedly. He turned in her direction and asked Miss Roanfield what she thought. The girl shuddered at his question. She began to say concerning progress, that she agreed that military power was a pledge of development, but let it be so. Could he justify the lost lives and broken destinies while making this progress? When the girl said this, she squeezed her own and delivered this speech with a share of sadness and sorrow. She remarked that Mr. Nottingham was correct in what he said, but the Wars are started because of people who believe in necessary evils. The girl looked earnestly at Mr. Nottingham as she said these words. After a moment, a smirk came over his face, and he remarked that this was Miss Rowanfield's opinion of the matter. The girl was dumbfounded, and all the other interlocutors turned their gazes on her. The girl mentally wondered if she had been too frank. There was an awkward silence in the room. Suddenly, Ian's brother, Eric, entered the conversation and said that he doubted he could keep up with all this talk of politics. Whereupon the young man sighed sadly and remembered that I wanted to ask if anyone was going to play tennis at Wimbledon this year. George surprisingly inquired if they were still playing tennis. Eric shared that yes, B 
because Ian is playing so well that he got a parlor to sign up for men's doubles. Ian asked his little brother to stop praising him. Madeline exhaled a sigh of relief when the conversation went in a different direction. Eric, meanwhile, asked his sibling to stop being modest. George remarked that he would like to get together with on the court someday. Models got up from her chair and headed away from the company. This caught Mr. Nottingham's eye. Eric kept talking to George, telling him that he would have to wrestle him first to compete with Ian later. George asked him to underestimate him, after which the boys laughed heartily. The girl went outside and leaned on the balcony, thinking that she didn't want to express her disagreement with Ian's opinion so openly. She was puzzled, because he wasn't too angry about it. Remembering the look on his face at that moment, she thought that in fact, he was enjoying it. A sudden sight caught her eye and she recognized Isabel walking in the park with a man. The man next to her was her favorite man. She was genuinely happy at this moment, a slight blush on her face, and she was laughing heartily in the man's company. Madeline, who was standing on the balcony, marveled at this picture, muttering that these guys looked so in love. Isabel would even die for him. Madeline thought that she might love like that someday. Suddenly, someone behind her called out to Miss Roanfield. The girl turned sharply and saw the gentleman of Nottingham behind her back. Ian asked the girl if he could talk to her. The girl realized that if he came closer, he would see his sister and Isabel walking with a man. In order to save the girl, Madeline herself rushed forward to Ian. At her action, Mr. Nottingham was embarrassed. He coughed awkwardly and replied that he would like to talk to her about what had happened during their last meeting. The girl immediately asked when. The girl was clearly uncomfortable. Mr. Nottingham noted that he shouldn't have scolded her for reaching out to Isabel. Madeline replied that no, he wasn't worried, and the girl understood. She declared that it was no big deal and rushed past Mr. Nottingham. Madeline mentally realized that Isabel was about to get caught, and she needed to get her brother out of here right away. She stopped and asked Mr. Nottingham if they should go inside. Ian looked at the girl and suddenly said that she was discouraging him. The girl turned sharply upon him, surprised at his words. Mr. Nottingham went on to say that for some time now, Miss Rowanfield had been making it firmly clear to him that she had no sympathy for him, and it looked as if the girl despised him too. Madeline clenched her hand into a fist and checked with him about the contempt. Mr. Nottingham replied that he did not know, and perhaps it just seemed so to him. He held out his hand to the girl, saying that he hoped her dislike wouldn't get worse, as they both wouldn't benefit from it. He also added that you never know what the future holds. The girl was silent, and Mr. Nottingham said that the sun was setting and it was getting colder outside so they should go inside. Suddenly the girl repeated his phrase that you never know what the future holds. She added that it sounded to her as if there was only misfortune ahead. She told him to go first and that she would like to admire the scenery a little longer. Mr. Nottingham asked if the girl was unwilling to open herself to him, even for a brief moment. He added that he respected her wishes and would leave her alone tonight. Outside, the wind blew. Mr. Nottingham added confidently that, however, he did not intend to retreat any further. The girl was astonished at his words. At that moment, she was suddenly reminded of the couple enjoying each other in the garden. She was genuinely curious, for however ridiculous it seemed in the eyes of these passionate lovers. Ian, who thought odor was love. He must have been incredibly funny to them. Looking at him, she noticed that this man was standing in front of her as if trying to protect her from the wind, when in fact, he was only casting his shadow over her. So she can't let him give her hope. Madeline remembered her past life again, 25 years ago. She was sitting on the bed with the dog at her feet. The girl's eyes were in a terrible state, and the huge bags under her eyes, she had obviously been crying a lot. Sitting on the bed, she wondered how much longer she would have to live like this. Tears started streaming down her face, wondering if she had to live like this until she died. Looking at the dog, she wondered what would happen to Corey when she was gone. And she immediately realized that more importantly, she wondered what would happen to her when Corey died. If he left her in this godforsaken place, she might go mad. She didn't understand if she had to spend the rest of her life here as a ghost, 
if she had to spend eternity in this hell, alone. Madeline jumped up abruptly from the bed, which immediately attracted the attention of Corey the dog, who started whining. The girl's hands were shaking and she asked the dog not to worry. He didn't need to worry about anything. The next morning came. Mr. Nottingham was writing something, but stopped abruptly and asked the butler what he had just said his wife had done. The butler replied that her ladyship, under cover of night, had left the manor. Madeline was driving a car at that moment, and Corey was sleeping peacefully on her lap. A moment later, we see a girl in a London downtown movie theater. She's sitting in one session and thinking about, I can't believe she's in a London movie theater. The girl's heart was pounding frantically as she mentally recited the fact that she had managed to escape from the house. The girl assumed that the estate must be in turmoil, and she wondered how her husband Ian was doing. She didn't realize if he was happy about what he was doing away from her, or if he might be upset. The girl was at the movie The Kid, 1921st year, which is a silent movie with Charlie Chaplin starring, where a tramp finds an abandoned child and raises him. Watching the movie, Madeline remembered that this is not even his own child, as he can do so much for him, because these two do not have a drop of common blood, and still they are a family. Suddenly, she realized that tears were streaming down her face. She covered her face with her hands, continuing to cry. In the next moments, we see the girl back in the room apologizing to Corey, which made him wait. So fast, time flew by. She put the food on him and talked about what a wonderful movie she had seen. People moving on the wall for her, so mesmerizing. Corey was enjoying the food at that moment. The girl noticed that it was good to be free and asked Corey to say so. She looked at the packet of food and wondered where she could buy food for Corey. Getting up from her squat, she looked at her reflection in the mirror. She noticed her tattered clothes and wondered where to wash them. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door addressing Madame and slipped a leaflet under the door directly into the room. She was informed that a telegram had arrived. The girl was very puzzled to see it. She realized that not a whole day had passed since her departure. With a trembling hand, she picked up the telegram. All it said was that she would be waiting for her at the station. The signature belonged to her husband, Ian Nottingham. The girl was terribly sad. I thought she had run away since she had reached London, but she must have jumped to conclusions. She was still shaking, but she wondered why she was relieved. We're back in Madeline's present, 17 years old. Another social gathering. Madeline sat in a chair with her hands folded in her lap. She wondered if it was impossible to live comfortably in this world without inheritance and marriage. The girl blinked sadly. She thought about how she should have memorized the names of at least ten companies to invest in before she died. As she continued to blink, Madeline concluded that she deserved to be a fool more than a noblewoman. The girl fell asleep and was tilted forward. But suddenly, someone touched her forehead. The girl immediately raised her head and saw Mr. Nottingham. The girl turned to him, and he replied that the girl looked incredibly tired lately. He flopped down on a nearby chair, suggesting that Madeline might not like the London air. She was a little surprised, and replied that she would agree that the air here was not clean, but she was staying up late because of her studies. Ian asked the girl if she was studying ancient Greek or something like that. Madeline remembered swearing at her father that it was as if a chicken had written in that ledger with its paw. To Mr. Nottingham, she replied. The girl replied that she would have said it was closer to a walnut tragedy and laughed lightly, awkwardly. She added that she was puzzling over how to avoid an unavoidable fate. Ian looked at her questioningly. Madeline blushed slightly, noting that, simply put, she was contemplating how to support herself. Mr. Nottingham hesitated, noting that young noblewomen didn't worry much about such things. He also wondered if it was about Mr. Rowanfield. The girl awkwardly replied that her father's habit of living large seemed to be known even in London. Mr. Nottingham felt embarrassed himself and apologized. The girl turned away from him, telling him not to apologize, for she really must prepare for the worst. Mr. Nottingham told the girl that she'd better not beat herself up and find someone to settle the matter for her. She needed to think, practically. Madeline smiled sweetly, 
saying that she supposed that was what most people did. She emphasized the word most, but she would like to live without depending on anyone. Suddenly, Madeline asked Mr. Nottingham if he had ever hated himself so much that he hated other people. Ian was puzzled by the girl's question and looked at her questioningly. He asked the girl why he should hate himself. The girl was surprised by his answer and puffed her hand, and then smiled sincerely and sweetly. Seeing her sincere laughter, Mr. Nottingham became embarrassed and blushed after her words. The girl apologized, for it was rude of her. Ian turned away and, coughing, said it wasn't at all. Madeline blushed slightly and said that his self-confidence was admirable. Suddenly the door to the room rattled open. George appeared in the room, addressing Madeline, but immediately hesitated to call her Miss Rowanfield. It was as if he were in a great hurry, being all sweaty and breathing heavily. He added that he was sorry to say it, but her father, Mr. Rowanfield, had gone bankrupt. The girl was dumbfounded at his words. The next moment, Madeline opens the door abruptly, immediately asking loudly where her father is. The maid, all in tears, replies to the mistress that his lordship is in the bedroom. The girl runs straight up the stairs, asking how long he has been there. The maid, stammering, replied that he had been there since lunchtime. However, he had given her orders not to let anyone in. Madeline couldn't believe it. She clutched the hem of her dress, mentally screaming that no. Calling for her father, the girl flew into his study, opening the door sharply. Before her was a picture of the butler feeding her father, who in turn was sitting up in bed. Madeline was shocked. The maid who had caught up with her added that her father had forbidden all but the butler to enter. The girl tried to catch her breath. The butler and the maid bowed and left, saying they would not be disturbed, then left, closing the door behind them. Madeline sat down next to her father's bed. The father asked his daughter why she was so nervous. She should act like a lady. The girl answered her father to forget and immediately inquired how come he was bankrupt. After all, he should have burned all those nefarious contracts. The father flinched, telling his daughter that he could see if she could. The next moment he sobbed and sprawled face down on the bed, loudly proclaiming that it was all because of him. Whimpering, he replied to the girl that the trading company he had invested in had collapsed and he had invested his entire fortune in it. Madeline was shocked. The father took his daughter's hand in his own, turning to her and telling her that she was his only hope now. At these words he began to glow, but there were still tears in his eyes. The girl thought to herself that perhaps she should be glad he hadn't done anything to himself. In this life, however, she would at least be able to help in some way. Madeline exhaled. Already out loud, she turned to her father, asking him not to worry because he was alive and well, so they would work it out somehow. Madeline stroked his arm. The girl began to say that first, they would sell the land and the house in London, and then they would go to work to pay off the debt. The father told his daughter not to talk nonsense, for what is it that noblemen have to work for? The girl was surprised at her father's answer. Toth went on to say that it was said that his daughter had taken a fancy to Mr. Nottingham. The girl was indignant, saying that they had only danced a few times. The father replied that this was what he was talking about, whether his daughter had any idea at all how little attention she paid to the opposite sex. He added that if he didn't know that, he would have hung himself a long time ago. He asked his daughter if she had still not come to her senses. Even if it wasn't Mr. Nottingham, there were plenty of other men in the world, so she should stop talking nonsense and start looking for a decent life partner. The next social occasion arrives. Madeline stands alone. She thought back to her conversation with her father, thinking that it seemed her father was adamant that she should marry a moneybags. She wondered how she could change his mind. If they sold the money, the tan house, and the Rowanfield estate, they would somehow get by, however. What would they even do for a living after that? Madeline sighed heavily. She was obviously angry and discouraged by the situation. She thought about the fact that this was far from a good time to go to a soiree if her father wasn't bedridden. Suddenly, someone turned to Miss Roanfield, asking if it was right that it was her. A well-drunk man approached her. She recognized him as Mr. Perriel. The man was slightly flushed and hiccuping from the amount of alcohol he had drunk. 
and in one hand he held an almost full glass of champagne. The man remarked that he was extremely pleased to see that she was enjoying his soiree. The girl bowed to the man. He asked her permission to ask her to dance. She apologized to him, saying that she wasn't feeling well right now, then added that maybe another time. The girl bowed once more, and Mr. Periel frowned at the girl's words. He shared that he had heard that the girl had had an accident in her family, but with her, Mr. Roanfield had nothing to worry about. The girl stiffened. Mr. Periel asked if it was true that she was 17, the height of youth. He suggested that she must have a string of gentlemen following her, ready to lend a helping hand. Mr. Periel added that he believed they could do without him. The girl's hands holding the hem trembled. She was thinking at that moment that they were already in a bad position and she could make it worse by being mean to him. The girl was mentally setting herself up to not have to pay attention. She quietly thanked Mr. Periel for his advice. Suddenly, Mr. Nottingham appeared and asked if they could play some music. The girl looked up at him and addressed him. Ian noticed that there was a nasty squeaking in his ears. Mr. Nottingham became terribly angry, saying that maybe he was the one hearing the bleeding of a drunken dumbass who couldn't tell the difference between wise counsel and inconsideration. Goosebumps went down Mr. Periel's skin. He left immediately, saying he'd get to the music right away. George remarked that Ian had gone straight at the poor host and added that he should have stayed out of it. Mr. Nottingham replied that he wasn't the type to stand by silently. Madeline was uncomfortable. George asked his friend, since when he had ever cared for Miss Roanfield. Suddenly, Madeline was grabbed under the arm. It was Isabel. She turned to her, saying that this was where she was, and added that a new catalog of dresses had just come out, so she wanted to go and look at it together. Mr. Nottingham looked questioningly at the girls. When they had moved a little farther away, Isabel looked to see that her brother was at a sufficient distance and inquired of the girl that was not how the ladies justified going off the subject. Isabel continued to say quietly that she kept wondering if the girl was a medium of some sort. Isabel noticed that her brother Ian was literally throwing knives at her with his gaze. She continued talking to Madeline, asking her if she could see the future or talk to the dead. The girl looked around nervously and replied that she was not thinking and mentally added that though she knew the future. Isabel knew that Madeline knew not only the name of her lover, but also what she was going to do. The girl wondered if they really wanted to die. Isabel replied indignantly that she only wanted to go for a ride in the automobile, though she was a little drunk. The girl wondered if she knew how stupid that was. Isabel remarked that she had thought she was a respectable lady, but she was not one to mince words. Madeline shared that she wasn't trying hard to save face in this life. Isabel chuckled at her answer, noting that she sounded like someone she knew. Flicking her case open, she pulled out a single cigarette. Medelian wondered who it was. Isabel smiled and said that yes, he was an old friend of hers. Isabel then said that something told her that they would be good friends too. Madeline was taken aback by her words. Isabel also added that by the way, she liked the girl a lot and here she was going to tell her something. Isabel shared that her brother, Mr. Nottingham, had said he intended to invite Miss Roanfield to their home. After saying that, Madeline thought to herself, she had entertained the thought that much had changed in this life. Isabel lit the cigarette she had put into her mouth. Behind her back, Madeline saw Ian looking in the girl's direction. She realized, however, that a huge wave called fate was taking her back to the past she had already experienced. Isabel wondered if the girl understood what that meant. She was shocked at Isabel's words.